In this video, we are going to go through the Winter 2017 Chapter 6 quiz. Uh, since I know we haven't spent a lot of time on this, I figured I would make a podcast for all of you and post it. So here we go. Um, we're going to go over last year's quiz. So question one says, which one of the following is not true? Okay, that's a really good word to look at. Not is a good idea. So A, gases mix freely to form homogeneous mixtures. We actually know that that is true because gases actually in and of themselves you know remember they have indefinite shape and indefinite volume so they can mix freely gases have definite shapes and volumes well hold on that's actually directly contradictory to what we just said so we know that this is an answer possibility okay C gases have low densities that's wrong and D gases tend to have small molar masses at room temperature uh yeah no that's it doesn't matter so and by the way, tend to have small molar masses. Well, if we look at, you know, what about H2 gas? Okay, Th that's uh, a molar mass of about 2 grams per mole. So it's not too bad. Um, so that's actually true. So we know that B is the answer. Number two, for gas at 1 atm and 25 degrees Celsius, choose one of the most accurate statements. Or the, the one most accurate statement, since I can't read. Um, a, gas molecules are far, far apart and nothing, a vacuum, is in between adjacent molecules. Actually, we went over that in class this past period, so I, just in going through the answers, would pick A to start with. However, uh, we can read the rest of them, but to save your time, uh, that is totally the correct answer. So we're just going to move on down here. Wow. Okay, which of the three changes are shown in the figure that best illustrates when the amount of gas is increased in a helium-filled rubber balloon at constant P and T, right? So, amount up, right? It just means that, remember, when gas is added, each mole of gas has 22.4 liters, so gas occupies its own individual amount of space. Okay, so really, we are looking for the balloon to get bigger. Okay, which is answer choice C. Okay, which is answer choice C. So, moving on from that question. Consider a fixed quantity of gas at constant pressure according to volume changes shown at the right. Okay, constant pressure. So P stays the same. Okay, P stays the same. When the pressure stays the same, that only thing, right, when we have S, T, P, we have this is pressure, and this is temperature. Okay, temperature and pressure, so that means that if P is staying the same, temperature has to change, right? So if it's talking about pressure, we can strike that out. Leaking out, we can strike that out. Right. Right. So if we make the temperature lower, what happens to the gas? Well, the gas will actually condense and take up a smaller amount of space. So getting from a smaller volume to a bigger volume by decreasing the temperature would mean that answer choice A cannot be selected. So we can say that answer choice B is correct. Okay, moving on to the next page. Oxygen gas is produced with potass when potassium chlorate decomposes. If I can read, that'd be great. Right. So we're just going to go through this problem very systematically. Okay. Remembering that our ideal gas law is PV equals nRT, or PIVNERT, if you're one of those people. But that is just, as we've seen, that is just pressure times volume equals the number of moles times R, which is 0 0.0821 for this case, and then T is the temperature in Kelvin. Kelvin, which is Celsius plus 273. So let's get started, shall we? I'm actually going to increase this size a little bit. Uh, but let's get going. So we at first, you know, at the first thing I'm noticing when reading this problem, so let's just read it first. If 337 mils of wet O2 gas is collected over water at 25 degrees Celsius, which have a, has a vapor pressure of 23.8 torr, and the barometric pressure is 756.0 torr. How many moles of KClO3 have de decomposed? Now, you'll notice it says potassium chloride. I read it as KClO3. That's just me, right? 
So anytime we have a vapor pressure, what we need to do is we actually have to subtract that from the pressure of the surroundings. So if we're calculating our pressure of oxygen, right, we're going to say that that's our 756.0 torr minus, right, our 23.8 torr, which equals, oops, which equals, right, 732.2 torr. Okay, now what we're actually going to do here, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger and slide on over for some more space, is we're going to multiply this already, we're going to do a unit conversion because we know we have to go to ATMs. So we're going to say in one ATM or atmosphere, there are 760 tor. Right? So we're going to multiply out, we're going to cancel out our tors and get atmospheres. So we're actually just going to write right below here, we have 9, 0.963 atmospheres. Okay, and we get three significant figures because there's three significant figures in 760 tor. So, let's continue down with the problem here. Sorry, zoom in, zoom out, all that jazz. So, let's continue on. Now we need to figure out the number of moles of O2. So I'm just going to do this lowercase n. Wow, nope. This lowercase n, and then an O2. Right? And we know that by rearranging, we're going to come back up here, by rearranging our ideal gas law for n, we know that n equals PV over RT, right? All we've done is we've divided both sides by RT. So we're going to come back to n. Wow, not back to our unit size. We're going to come back to that number of moles of O2. And we are going to go pressure times volume. So 0.963 ATMs times 0 0.337 liters divided by 0 0.0821 times 298 Kelvin. It's a good number to know. Room temperature in Kelvin is always at that. Okay, so then we can say that our number of moles equals 0 0.0133 moles of O2. It looks like an L. O2. Okay. So now, we actually can get 2 moles of KClO3, right? Because when we're doing this problem, we can know, right, our stoichiometric coefficients are over here. We have a 2 in front of KClO3, we have a 2 in front of KCl, and we have a 3 in front of O2, right? So when we come out here, we're actually going to go do this part of the problem over here. Okay. We're going to take, and I'm actually going to do this part in red just because it's different so it doesn't blend in. Okay. We're going to take our 0 0.0133 moles of O2. We're going to multiply that, right? by 3 moles of O2 and 2 moles of KClO3 on top. Wow, that is definitely not what I did. And then we can do our multiplication and all that jazz and get 0 0.00884 moles of KClO3. Okay? And we did that just by using our stoichiometric coefficients and plugging them into the problem. So as we scroll down here, wow. Oops. As we scroll down here. Okay? As we scroll down here which one or more of the following are true of a gas balloon containing a mixture with equal numbers of moles of helium and neon at a total pressure of 1.00 atm. Right? 
So we know by Dalton's law of partial pressures, actually it might not be Dalton, but the law of partial pressures, right, that if there are equal amounts of two gases in one space and a given pressure, that you can just say that the gases are at equal pressure, and that is only for equal amounts. But this works for proportions as well, so keep that handy. Okay, so when we come in on this question number eight, which one or more of the following are true for a gas balloon containing a mixture with equal, equal parts of two gases at one ATM, right? Can we say that all the atoms are traveling at, a, at the same speed? No, we really can't. And the reason we can't is because helium atoms and neon atoms will travel actually at different speeds because they have different molar masses. There are different amounts of protons and neutrons in the nuclei, so that's going to prevent us from traveling at the same stuff, right? And actually, since helium is so much lighter, it will actually travel faster than neon. Okay, so moving on. Okay, letter B, pressure of helium equals pressure of neon equals half an atmosphere. Yeah, I would totally say that because that's partial pressures right there. Letter C, uh, the average speed of the helium atoms is greater than the average speed of the neon atoms. Well, actually, we just said that, and I actually owe to my Kahoot things where I start giving away answers. Um, the average speed is actually quicker. And the reason we say this is actually because helium atoms are so much lighter. We actually, I actually said it already, and I hate to be redundant, but just to drive the point home, um, there's less really going on in terms of mass in the nuclei, nucleus, so they can travel faster. And the average kinetic energy of helium atoms is greater than neon atoms. Well, this is not necessarily true. Because if we remember from days in physics, and we're going to just come over here for a second, right? Kinetic energy equals one-half mass times velocity squared. And when we have this mass thing here, right, helium atoms may be traveling at a higher velocity, but they have a lower mass. Right? Neon atoms may be traveling at a lower velocity, but they have a higher mass, so we can't necessarily say for sure which kinetic energy is greater because we don't actually know. Okay, so I would just say we can strike through letters A and letter D, and we can go with B and C being true. Number 10, the figure at the right shows the Boltzmann distributions for a gas at two different temperatures, so we know this is the same gas. Which curve corresponds to the lower temperature? And you guys actually had a smart work question on this, right? You had a, a smart work question on it, right? So if we look at the, the curves all together, if, if this question is on your exam, you lucked out. Um, because we actually know that the lower temperature is curve one. And by process of elimination, right, the higher temperature is curve two. So for the sake of answers on this exam, it would be that first one that I wrote down but just for any future reference, that is how we deal with this and Boltzmann curves. So good job. Um, last question, uh, based on the kinetic energy of the gases, explain why the gas pressure increases as the volume of the gas decreases with number of moles and temperature remaining constant. Okay. If we have a smaller volume, right, And I'm writing with a really sketchy stylus right now, so I'm sorry if it's messy. If we have a smaller V, right, that means that the gas molecules have more collisions with the walls of the container. Okay, when we have more uh, collisions with the walls of the container, we have a greater force, which equals in big double-headed arrow, or double-lined arrow here, because this is, um, this is the really, this is the culmination point. That means with more force, comes a higher pressure. Okay. 
And we know that actually that is the correct conclusion. So hats off to y'all. So the biggest thing here is we have to look what the question is actually asking, okay? Based on the kinetic theory of gases, the kinetic theory of gases, or kinetic molecular theory, you know, this is also a valid place to use KMT. It's a gross T. Mine up there. Explain why the gas pressure increases as the volume of the gas decreases, right? Right? Think of this as being a balloon. And you want to take the balloon and make it smaller without letting any air out. You know, how hard is that to do? It's, it's actually a little bit difficult. And you guys actually did this in the lab in your second experiment when you did the fun with gas laws, um, pressure monitoring system with the vernier, or vernier, whatever you want to call it, um, products. So this is definitely something that you guys are all familiar with. Um, and it's really just something where you have to translate and say, yeah, I've totally done this before. Um, I'm just going to circle this number one as my answer. But anyway, uh, I hope this helped all of you in a little bit of an easier way. Um, let's just really, really quickly, just to remind all of you, just to remind all of you, um, there will be an SI session Monday. What is happening to my pen? Okay, better. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. Still getting used to this. Right? Monday at 8.30 a.m. in Mark Jefferson, room 156, right before your quiz. So come out and say hello, any of that stuff, all that jazz, um, if you are interested in having some quiz review. We will be doing quiz review and since the answer key is up, I can answer midterm questions. Right. So anyway, thank y'all for paying attention and dealing with the entirety of this podcast. Even if you just used it for one explanation or the other, I'm glad that I could put this up to help you guys through it. Um, this is basically what your chapter six quiz will be because it is a condensed quiz. So I will see you tomorrow. And I hope y'all have a good evening. Bye-bye.